Yeah, I've got the microphone. So I should say this is less of a talk and probably more of a conversation. Um, oh, that's very yellow. I won't stand there. I can't see anything now. Um, I think both Adrian and I've been in the kind of UK makerspace scene for a long time now. I set up Cambridge Makerspace, um, leaving my former job to do that at the end of 2011. Um, and does was already going and in Liverpool, so we've been doing this well. I think I wanted sort of part of the motivation why people have maker spaces and the sort of culture of making is quite close to some of the messages we get about open source. It's about empowering people, enabling them to do more things, democratizing access to technology. And whilst I am an engineer and have obviously worked in this and believed it for a long time, I guess I'm now at a point where I'm starting to question some of whether or not make a culture and make a space is really delivering um, on that sort of empowerment um, and collective good. And in particular, I think we've both been pondering on this most recently following the um, sad demise of Make, which was a Californian company behind Make magazine and behind the Make a Fair brand as well, which has sadly closed down in the last couple of weeks. And that I think has really stimulated some questioning about the nature of the maker movement um, more generally. So I think we're going to be sort of talking about things inspired by that. That would be my introduction anyway. I don't know. Uh, yes, I think I think that's, that sums things up quite nicely, Laura. Um, uh, yeah, I'm Adrian McEwen. I've been doing embedded software my entire career. Uh, started Does Liverpool uh, with a bunch of other people in June, well, we got our space in June uh, 2011, so a little bit before. I remember having conversations with you, Laura, and this kind of harks back to the biomaker space, talking about the joys of um, university bureaucracy, because Laura, like, does grew out of a thing that stuck, yeah, we came up with the original ideas in, like, the end of 2008, started 2009, took us a couple of years to get a community and then get a space. Um, and then I remember having conversations with you, Laura, back, back then. And you were kind of like, well, I've got, we've got this, you know, we've got some funding and we're setting up this Cambridge Make Space. And like, and then, you know, a, a year later, we we started Does, and you were still kind of wrangling with bureaucracy and things. And then eventually you opened like six months or something after us. Um, so I guess one thing I think would be, does everybody here know what a maker space is? Does anybody not know what a makerspace is? I suppose. Okay, cool. Yeah, yeah. I'm, I'm mostly just before we ramble on lots and assume lots of things, I figured it might be useful just to kind of explain a little bit about what the spaces are. Uh, but no, everyone knows what it is. Excellent. That's cool. Um, so I don't know how we're going to dive. Like we, we've got, Laura has more notes than I do. I have, I have some, uh, Okay, so I get the right way around because otherwise I'll end up talking about some previous talk that I turned out my my note cards. I was like, oh, I've got some. Note oh yeah, these have got previous. So I'm not talking about certification and things. Um, oh well, I, I don't think I am. Um, it's not a thing I need to be reminded to talk about. Um, and I guess uh, I don't know what's the easiest route into this. Were you you had more of an order to your cards than I did to mine. <laughs> So if we all have a sense of what maker spaces are, I guess the sort of related question is what is making? What is the purpose of it? What does it mean to be a maker? Um, and I don't have a definition, but I think there's lots of different angles on making that different communities related to making bring to this. Um, so a certain level of criticism that I've heard recently leveled at making is that it is basically a kind of consumer pastime. It's a hobby. Um, it's something that you do because it's fun as an individual. Um, another kind of making or part of the maker movement is more focused on education. So it's thinking about making as a route to increase skills, making as a route to engage people, either adults or children, in STEM subjects and computing and technology, that sort of thing. Um, and then there is a sort of cultural piece, which I say is about empowerment and enabling. So it's not just skills for the sake of having some nice skills, it's skills that might help you get a job, skills that might business. There's often a sense that this is a route to economic empowerment as well. I think it's interesting to sort of ask whether or not making is delivering on that for volumes of people. I think it's certainly fair to say in the UK it's delivering on that for a small number of people. Um, there are some people who've come into maker spaces and I could certainly in Cambridge pick at 
a set of people who've come in, who've learned new skills and who have changed career, have set up a small business, um, maybe got together with some friends and set up a slightly larger business. So clearly it does work somewhat for some people, but I'm not sure that it was on the sort of larger scale empowerment and skills change, really considering that Cambridge Make Space has had over a thousand members in the years that we've been open. I would probably say there's less than 10 who've actually had a significant career change or new economic opportunities because of that. Um, many people have learned skills, but they haven't managed to do anything with them in terms of empowering themselves. Just briefly before I hand back to you, there's also a lot of focus in making is on the sort of on kids, right? So there's a lot and lot of maker projects. In fact, these two businesses that have come out of Cambridge Make Space have been about engaging children in STEM subjects. So they've been small robotics platforms or gaming systems, that sort of thing. Um, and I think we should sort of question that a little bit, how much that's driven by real need and interest and how much that's actually driven by people of our sort of age, for some value our sort of age, making assumptions about what the next generation might want or might need. Um, there was a recent um, conversation we've been involved in which is talking about the demise of maker media and there was a great quote which was which is entirely anecdote but to be clear not data generation z is less interested in tech do-it-yourself kind of technology which seems like a fantasy of nostalgic authenticity and grassroots technological crafting and instead today's children are more interested in creating unique sub subcultures around the parts of the internet they work in so they don't have their parents' desire to build a robot or tinker with the internals of a computer. They're much more interested in more social aspects and you know, engaging technology in different ways. So that was really interesting because that made me question a lot of the assumption of let's just have some you know, great maker, maker affairs or whatever. Kids will come along and they'll be empowered and educated. Really started to make me wonder if that was useful or even true. It's, it's interesting because I think the, the whole like kits and ed kids educational so i think you, there's definitely a sort of a trope as it were through the kind of maker movement of of people kind of building a thing and then we're like, yes we've got this amazing new we're going to teach kids stem and some of it i suppose is because there's a lot of talk about trying to teach kids stem and things but it feels that to me like there's at times and i, I guess this is something that i've personally been kind of butting against probably most of the time i've been because I, I, yeah, I, I'm one of the co-founders of Does Liverpool, and I run the makerspace. But um, like Jenny said, this is just a way of giving up all of your evenings and weekends, and probably vast amounts of your working time as well. Um, <laughs> because I, yeah, I don't earn anything from Does Liverpool. I pay the same amount for my desk as you would if you wanted to move in. Um, and then I run my business on the side, which is building Internet of Things devices, or, or you know, attempting to get to a point where I'm building and shipping products. Um, feels like there's at times um kits and things is because it's you can sell to you can see the market you need to sell to and because we're all just geeks and it's may i may horribly be just you know this is all my opinions and this is me this is what i'm like not necessarily not necessarily what everyone else is like but um <laughs> marketing isn't my strong point uh so getting to that point where you kind of go oh i could build a thing and i could sell it to somebody who i know and i know what they look like and i know where they hang out um, and I might make some sales that way. So there's an element of like selling to a market you understand um, rather than finding the kind of mass market thing. And I'm much more interested in trying to find the mass market thing um, or just have more of an impact, I guess. Not necessarily it doesn't have to be mass market, but um, and some of it, I wonder whether it's just where we are with how easy it is to get things manufactured. Like I know how to get almost any number of printed circuit boards made like from sort of like a handful of them made in China and shipped to me and then I can do stuff with them through to PCB assembly houses and there's lots of blog posts people talking about how you would do this um, and the electronics things you need to go and buy there's Farnell and RS and all of those sorts of you know Alibaba um, and that's all really well understood so it's easy to see as a building a business like oh this is how I would go and do that and get that and get that and then when I've been trying to build um, the Acker's Bell, which is a IoT product that I'm developing. Uh, mostly just need to finish the Kickstarter video and get it out there. Uh, <laughs> it's an internet-connected brass bell. 
that goes ding whenever you want it to do something. So recently it went, the one in the office went ding, 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 ding which meant that Theresa May had resigned. Um, <clears throat> because just after the general election, when it looked like it was imminent then, uh, <laughs> uh, I set it up to monitor has Theresa May, resi has Theresa May resigned yet dot com that somebody else was helpfully providing my data source. Uh, and it looked to see whether that web page still just said no. <laughs> and then when it changed to say yes, uh, it rang the bell. Um, but then I had to work out how I was gonna source six inch brass bells, which it turns out was from India when I looked on Alibaba and things. And then, and then I needed to know how to get a pallet of bells from India, because they weren't gonna ship it to me. And I needed to find a freight, freight forwarder and then I could watch it on a container ship. And yeah, it was all loads more complicated than building electronics. Um, so it feels like there's that kind of, we're still learning what those routes are. And some of those routes are very big and expensive. I mean, in another project I'm involved in at the minute, we're doing in, looking at injection molding and our tooling costs are likely to be like 18 grand. Um, so we need to find out how much money before we can make one injection molded box <laughs> to put a thing in. It's like, okay, that's quite a lot of money we've got to go and find from somewhere if because we're not VC backed. Um, so by scaling those sorts of things up is, tr is tricky, but it feels, I suppose I also believe that the make, one of the possible things for the maker movement is that it could provide a route for many more people to be working these things out, building these sorts of things and kind of scaling that sort of stuff up. So you don't have to, like providing alternatives to, oh yeah, well you just need to go and sweet talk some venture capitalists. We'll give you enough money to go off and do whatever you're gonna do. Um, and then at some point you'll get listed on the stock exchange and you'll cash out or you'll get bought by Google and you'll cash out. And then probably, in my experience at least, whatever cool tech it was that you were working on will just slowly die as part of Google or something. Um, I mean, you know, I had that in, Cambridge in the late 90s when we built the first web browser on a mobile phone, got bought by Microsoft, which looked very much like we'd won <laughs> at the time. Uh, but, you know, it shipped on a few million handsets and then we weren't an interesting bit of Microsoft. You know, we weren't generating enough money for Microsoft. We were only on like 5 million mobile phones. Uh, <laughs> and so, yeah, we, and what looked like success turned out to be well, you know, my boss got very rich and I got a deposit for my house. So it wasn't, you know, completely useless, but it also didn't, like you aren't all using the web browser that I helped write. Um, that all died. Which I think says something interesting about scale, right? And what scale gets valued. So coming from Cambridge, I have a bit of a rant that the only kind of entrepreneurship that often seems to be valuable in Cambridge, which is very much a tech cluster, is high-tech entrepreneurship that gives you hockey stick growth and a beer sit at the end of the day. It's almost certainly VC back. People who are starting other kinds of businesses, perhaps smaller electronics businesses or small service businesses, which might be anything from a small cafe or a clothing repair store, are just not even interested. Not only is there very little visible support for them, they're almost written out of Cambridge's narrative. They're not visible, no one cares about them. And yet that's the kind of business that most of the UK has. Most people work for SMEs, they're not high growth SMEs, they're not going to be sold to Microsoft. So Chris Anderson, um, who wrote Makers and has been very involved in this kind of scene, um, just think about your point about what does it mean to actually scale up in this sort of maker space. He says there's only five businesses that have scaled up around the making kind of universe. Um, and they are Adafruit, which we know is sort of electronics vendor, um, Raspberry Pi and Arduino, so sort of similar territory again, very big scale. Little bits, who knows little bits? Well, so little bits, I guess, is a sort of very easy to use electronics kit for children, sort of plug together components. It's quite quite a lot of fun. And he also recognizes that crowdfunding is something that's actually come out of the maker movement or whose growth has come with the maker movement. So things like Kickstarter and crowd supply, ways that you can get together demand from a lot of people to enable a new project to happen. But I think there's something interesting about that because that's a very small number of businesses to have come out of the global maker movement over however long it's been going, sort of at least a decade. Um, and I think also the challenges of doing that, you've sort of described some, even just for something like the Akers Bell and internet connected, that was a very complicated thing for you to get that made. 
whatever your volume is, right? You've got a lot of moving parts, supply chain network. Obviously, you've got research and development and marketing and things as well. It's not just one skill set. You've got to know how to source bells and how to me, test bells or something, as well as an electronics piece, a software piece. There's a lot of stuff going on. Um, and so the kind of capital and effort needed to go from you know, the magical light bulb moment through to a product line with people paying for them is pretty huge, right? Um, I think, so to come back to my point about Cambridge, you sort of focus on these high growth things. So often, you know, if I wanted to go and raise 50 million or something to do a high tech venture, that would probably be easier than for me to raise, say, 50,000 to pursue a small business that would perhaps pay my costs and perhaps a bit of my salary, right? So there's a really interesting disparity. And for all of the joy of making and maker spaces, helping people a little bit on their journey to become able to make things themselves and maybe to make you know themselves a new job or a business from doing that, the challenges I wonder are perhaps not the things that maker spaces actually solve. We're giving people some tools and that's good. And we're giving them access to a community of folks with different skills and these are useful steps along the way we have a much more fundamental problem about access to capital and agency to actually start a business um, i was going to mention briefly here i think also the other kinds of businesses you can start which i think i would say to me is sort of starting to offer a little more hope so thinking perhaps forgetting our vc back tech businesses what are other models for building interesting things probably with a technical flavor given that making tends to have a technical flavor that could still give us businesses, jobs, employment, useful products, and so on. And in the last few years, I've been very interested in thinking about um, cooperatives as a way of trying to keep some of the ownership of a business in the hands of the workers, the customers, or the local community in some way, um, and community interest companies as well, which is companies who are there doing a business, they operate like a normal business, but there's no way to extract profits. All the surplus generated has to be plowed back into the community and into the mission. Um, so I think those are an interesting way forward. And how could we help maker spaces spawn more businesses, give them the support they need to actually create products and not necessarily to have to take that quite aggressive venture capital kind of backed route? And I think there are some signs, and maybe part of the reason there's only five, like big, you know, names we can be named with that, is is that because they're the big success stories, and like maybe what we need to be doing is finding a way to have to talk about many lot, you know, lots and lots of people doing smaller businesses as being as successful as one business doing a big thing, um, and I don't know what. The answer i'm still like i don't have any answers particularly around some of that sort of thing but there's some interesting conversations going around it there was um rebecca son that wrote a good piece about this recently that i can't remember the name of but maybe if you find a name you can go and dig it out and ella fitzsimmons is it did a really good talk uh, a year or so ago about kind of you know this myth of the hero kind of person who makes the vc and uh, makes the makes the startup and then is the kind of like, you know, the outsider who kind of disrupts and what have you. And she's like, they're all apparently dash di outsiders, yet they're all kind of middle-class white males. Yeah, apparently they're outsiders. Um, and talking about this kind of like, can we get away from this sort of the hero's journey being the way that we talk about this sort of stuff. And so I suppose to throw some slight counters from their experience in, in Liverpool, one of the things we have done um or have enabled and stuff i mean like we didn't you know mostly it was the people who've set up the businesses who did things like we did provide them a laser cutter they could come and use um but and it's always the way that the you know, the 3d printer is seen as the kind of future of technology um and but that's what gets people through the door because they've heard about it uh, and then you kind of go yeah yeah that you could probably could use the 3d but like have you seen this laser cutter over here <laughs> this is loads better you can choose more materials and you can have, you know, your, it'll be done much quicker. Um, it's much easier to, to, to design for. Um, and the laser cutter that we've got in Does Liverpool, um, basically because of our laser cutter, there are now eight more laser cutters in Liverpool um, than there would have been if we hadn't had a laser cutter that people would come in and use. Um, and it's, you know, it's 12 quid a day to come and laser cut, which is a ridiculous bargain. Um, <laughs> 
but that means that we can get as many people as possible in to learn about this stuff and to try it out. And so we, like of the ones that have kind of spun out, basically it's people come in, work out how to use a laser cutter, realize it's not quite such a scary machine. Um, sometimes learn to do a bits of maintenance on it as well, because we do all the maintenance on the machines um, pretty much. And, um, and, and also can then build up their business. So um, Amy does laser cut uh, wedding kind of invites and place settings and like laser etched um, hang, like coat hangers for hanging your bridesmaids dresses on with their name etched into them and things like that. Um, and Animal Hearn's an artist uh, who sells this kind of crazy range of iridescent acrylic um, jewelry and sunglasses and things. So I guess they're not very tech. Um, they use a laser cutter, but that's just to do pre precise cutting. Um, and Jade does laser cut lampshades that she sells on Etsy and stuff. And so basically the people, there's a whole bunch of people who can come in and use the space, use it to make some of their stuff, sell it, build up a business, work out there's a market for what they're trying, what they they thought they could build and was cool. And then at some point they get to the level where they need to be able to put like a week's worth of laser cutting and you can't with us because we've got a shared resource. So you can book your next visit to the laser cutter. So you can get a whole day <laughs> on your booking system. And so then, then they get to a point where it's like, okay, I could really do being able to get on it more often. Um, but at that point, you've proven that you can sell things and presumably make a, a living from it, um, or at least you know, you're selling them for more than it costs you to make them. And then kind of going and finding five grand to get your own laser cutter isn't, I mean, like it's not nothing, but it's the sort of amount that you should be able to raise if you're running a business. Um, and so, yeah, now we only ever see Amy when she wants to cut big things because she, you know, the laser cutter she got is kind of in between the two sizes that we've got. Um, so every now and then she's got something big to cut. And so we'll see her then it's like every few weeks. Um, and other than that, she's just off like running that business. Um, so yeah, I'm not sure, apart from some examples, quite where I was going with that, but just the, the breadth of, of kind of, and I suppose it's not just about actually make a, you know, laser cutters and 3D printers and soldering irons. Um, we don't have the level of kind of biomake spaces um, sort of kits, although there are some people experimenting with some sort of fluidics systems or something, microfluidics and acoustic fluidics. There's a bunch, like two different people in the space are experimenting with that and kind of using the vinyl cutter to cut paths for fluids to go down to work as filters and things, which. Right. Cool. Um, yeah, so you should check out, like Jeremy's doing some really interesting acoustics so to make little pumps or something out of that, um, which might be interesting to, yeah, um, to chat about at some point with him. Um, and then there's, you know, we've grown kombucha to make leather, to laser cut it, to make patterns. And there's people experimenting with laser etching velvet um, just because we're in an area called the fabric district. And so there's a fabric shop just down the road. So he was like, I'm just going to go and buy some fabric and put it in the laser cutter. Uh, <laughs> um, so it's, there's a whole load of people. I mean, there's a bunch of people doing internet of things stuff as well and playing with the latest toys and gadgets, but there's much more kind of diverse making going on in, in the kind of, in some of the space. And there's another maker space just down the road from us in Liverpool called Little Sandbox. And they're in a kind of deprived area of Liverpool. And they ended up there because they went and ran some makers. We, we were doing some work with the libraries uh, in Liverpool and they got a bit of funding to go and do some maker spaces. So they were running things that were a bit more your traditional, like teach kids to code, um, do stop motion animation video things as well. And like 3D printing and laser cutting. And they went and ran them in this uh, bit of Liverpool and it was just blocked. I oversubscribed. And so they were like, wow, there's a huge community of people here who are really interested in this stuff and wanting to play around with it. Um, so they ended up moving their maker space to the library in Norris Green because um, the library had some space they were wanting to rent out to somebody. So it just all kind of fitted in nicely. And then Chris, who runs that, is was chatting to the librarian going, what books on making do people take out? Because I want to try and get to know the local community. And she was like, well, kind of mostly knitting patterns. Um, so they started a knitting club, um, which is it's during the day. 
so it's mostly kind of retired mostly women i think i haven't made it long to it yet uh, and they called it tech styled um because everybody loves a good pun uh <laughs> And it's mostly just that these you know, group of, of people come along and, and knit. But then when they got to the point where they'd knitted a new cardi for their grandkid or whatever, um, they were like, well, you want some buttons for it, do you? Okay, well, there's this laser cutter over here. Like, you could laser cut some little buttons out of wood, and then you can etch your name onto them. Um, or you can use the 3D printer to make some buttons. And it's just finding different ways to draw people in that wouldn't normally have that kind of tech thing. They're not going to be turning up going, I want to know how to 3D print buttons. Um, like, but, but because the space is there, there is that kind of opportunity for it to kind of tap into. Um, I think you raised two interesting points there. One is how you can get some makerspace stuff in more deprived areas. Cause I think at the moment, you know, does is in a city center of a reasonable condition city. Cambridge is clearly in, you know, an extremely privileged city in many ways that we're also extremely unequal but we do have a lot of wealth and also a lot of people with free time and i guess my two questions or thinking is sort of how do we get some of the benefits if we think this is a useful kind of thing to have how do we get it to areas that are much more afflicted by austerity that are much more deprived in terms of access to free donated equipment access to companies who sponsor them and would pay for stuff or even access to volunteer labor, because having the time to be able to go and spend your weekends, as I think it's fair to say all of us have done, is something of extreme privilege. And busy communities who are trying to make ends meet do not have the time to go and, and set up this sort of thing. So that's sort of one question is how do we get these spaces to the communities that perhaps need them more than you know, we do in Cambridge? We don't really need extra support to help create high-tech businesses. Pretty much everyone is in a very privileged position. Many of our members already have workshops in their home garages. Um, you know, so we don't need it as much as others. How do we get it to communities who need it more? And secondly, just to your last point, I was interested about the knitting patterns. I can't, I don't know, but you know, do the people who come and, and perhaps in originally introduce those spaces through things like knitting patterns, would they even recognize the term makerspace or identify as makers? Um, I, I mean, they might identify a maker as if you kind of said, are you a maker? They'd be like, well, I don't know. I do some knitting or something, but I don't think they'd go, I'm a maker. Like they'd probably say they were a knitter, um, I assume. Um, and they've, you know, they do branch out into other things. They've been doing laser cut coasters and bookmarks and things as well. Um, now to kind of branch out and the kids come along as well and they end up doing more, slightly more of the techie stuff, I think. Um, and it is a, a challenge. I don't quite know how how we we broach some of that stuff. It's something we're aware of, but I suppose because we're self funded, it does the ball like you know we don't have any in, any grant income or something. We pay market rates for our space. Um, it's paid for by the members for the members. Um, so I guess on that sort of level, there's a kind of I don't know, it's not quite an open source ethos to it, but it's that sort of the commons and and kind of building and, and clubbing together to do stuff um a sort of approach to it but but it does exclude at times we have free so this evening is make a night so if i wasn't here i'd be back in liverpool in the space um helping people to you know kind of play around with their their projects and things um so we've got the, and that's the best it's kind of the best we can do at the minute um and we wonder about some of the stuff so where we are in this, we're on kind of the edge of the city center. Um, and then there's like a massive dual carriageway. And then you've got Everton, which is another relatively deprived bit of, of the city. Um, and we're trying to work out how we kind of get to know the people over the road, as it were, um, and draw them into the space and, and work out how everybody can benefit from this sort of stuff. Because it feels like that's one of the, I don't know, for me, one of the possible kind of benefits of the maker spaces and things like it's you know we don't really talk about it but we're, there's an element of owning the means of production if you kind of like not that i know my like, you know, that's marks presumably isn't it um like yeah uh, but it's that kind of level of you know having access to the tools being able to modify them like jenny said to modify and to do what you want to do um and it also feels like doing building your own tools is an important thing there's in the discussion that we're <clears throat> we were part of online 
there was there was a kind of a general sort of dismissive attitude to 3D printing as being this kind of like, well, it's a nice little fad, and it produces, you know, everybody can do it, get their own 3D printed Yoda head, um, and then and then it's just generating loads more plastic waste, and who needs that? Um, and and those are kind of valid criticisms on some level, but it also feels to me like the fact that you get 3D printers and maybe less so now they're becoming so cheap to get from China in good condition and give you good prints. But definitely five years ago, like you had to, you, you'd learn quite a bit about, you know, Arduinos and how stepper motors work and maybe you'd learn what G-code is and how you drive these things. And all of that sort of stuff is about how you can build your own machines. And that's just kind of runs all the way through the maker space. And you know, yeah, we, we don't pay somebody to come and fix our laser cutter. We just work out how to do it. You know, we've got three laser cutters in the space now, one of which is huge. We got given it by a school because they'd been given it, but not with the computer with the software on. So it suddenly became this not a useful thing they've been given and actually this massive kind of waste of space because they didn't have a couple of grand to spend on software for it and they gave it to us. And so there's a bunch of the community are like yeah okay we can put different controllers in this and then there's this software we'll get for it it's going to cost us like 500 quid and we'll have a laser cutter that's got six foot by four foot bed or something stupid like that um and that kind of ability to understand how your tools work and to modify them i guess the open source you've got that a little bit it feels I mean, you know, from my experience of open source is being able to just kind of tap into the libraries and dig down and see what's going on and fix problems if they're there or take that and kind of apply it in a different way so building new tools feels like an important skill for for the west to have because we've mostly just given it up in the past <laughs> and kind of going well we can do it cheaply in china um so they should make all of our machines now <laughs> and then like when we need to make a new different type of machine well we're not going to work out how to do that so there's not going to be any innovation in kind of what new machines we have coming out of out of the uk unless we can start to kind of rebuild that knowledge and 3d printers feels like one of the routes to do that um i really like the idea of owning the means of production i think part of some of the so maker spaces and making is such a broad church right there are so many different pieces within the maker movement insofar as we can define it as a movement at all i think part of it Part of the unhappiness with some of the Silicon Valley culture of making, which came from Make Magazine a little bit, from some of the very corporate culture of Make Affairs, some of that frustration was that the maker movement in that instantiation seemed to have co-opted some of the more traditional and politically motivated movements of the past. So um, crafters would be part of that, um, the sort of folks who've been campaigning now for a long time for right to repair and the ability to actually own and repair more complex goods. Some of the sort of valley culture, I think, has kind of hidden that away. We started to valorize more making a nice thing that looks good, you know, with some LEDs in it, over being able to make my own tool or have agency over my tool, or perhaps to repair something. Um, I do think there's something about 3D printing there as well. So at Makespace, some of the earliest things that we made were actually spare parts or replacement parts for second equipment that was donated to us, which was broken and had things missing. And the 3D printer was the tool that let us print, you know, the knob that hadn't come on the lathe from 1969, and we could no longer source spare knobs, but we could design one and print it and instantly have a knob where previously there was just a bare metal screw. Um, so actually, 3D printers are very enabling if you use them in that sort of way. And I think you have an example of repairing a Dyson vacuum cleaner. Um, so again, you know, you've got an alternative of very expensive proprietary spare parts, or maybe you can actually just design and make your own replacement part, or maybe even make it better than the original, because you know what you use that equipment for, and you can adjust the design to, to meet your needs. So it is very empowering. But I think in maker culture, we tend to see far more of the Yoda heads. Yoda heads, by the way, for those of you thinking, why do they keep talking about printed Yoda heads. It is an archetype of, of maker culture and 3D printer in particular that the most commonly printed item is a Yoda head because everyone when they get their 3D printer they print a Yoda head and it's on the first thing on the shelf for any make space. Um, so it's not entirely a ridiculous example. But 
we tend to do that. We far less often champion the examples where we've used our 3D printers or other tools to repair items, to keep older equipment in service, that sort of thing. It's just not so sexy and exciting as making a shiny thing that I can show off to my friends and say, look, I made this glamorous item, even if in fact it's quite short lived and I'll show it off for a week and then it'll go and sit in the drawer for a year and then I'll throw it away as e-waste into the wrong waste bin category. Um, whereas keeping you know, equipment in repair and so on is much harder to showcase. Um, yeah, in MakeSpace, we eventually got replacement. We managed to source ses secondhand knobs for that lathe. So our beautiful 3D printed examples um, have gone. All we've got now is the photographs. So we should have them on a shelf. Absolutely, we didn't do a very good job of that. But I also think you did mention there the sort of global context, and Jenny mentioned it too, the sort of fact that all of this maker movement that we're talking about is still very heavily Europe and North America. Um, the kind of ideas behind making and repairing and crafting and access to tools and agency over tools is so different in the global south. I couldn't even begin to talk to that. But we have this kind of maker, kind of global brand, which lays claim to a lot of things. And we're losing the narratives of other communities who have different ways of thinking about this and different ways of actually you know, you also right, there's a time thing as well, right? 50 years ago in the UK, many more people had skills to repair things locally in different ways that we don't have now. But I think we lose sight of the fact that not everyone has the same maker culture, or perhaps they shouldn't have the same maker culture, and that a particularly northern kind of colonial view isn't always so helpful. So we're running out of time, so we should probably actually kind of be more positive. I was going to try to have some positive end notes. But yeah. Good yeah, thank you, Mike. Yeah. Um, yeah, how do you think um, this meshes with current ideas about the future of work, given that so many things which can be mass produced will be mass produced uh, by machines? And what does that leave for anybody to do or to aspire to do? So I don't know believe in the automation of all the jobs and the way that that is often talked about i think we're also to actually if we're going to talk about that we need to talk about future challenges more broadly right so we need to talk about climate and energy we need to talk about limited scarce natural resources and material waste given that we're in 2019 we also need to talk about geopolitics because we may be going towards a more fragmented world than the globalized world we've been driving towards for the last few decades I don't know that I would rely on global supply chains being quite as reliable as they have been. So I actually think this is an opportunity to move towards local production and more collective creation and repair and care for things that matter locally. Because I think the other piece in that, in the labor question is actually about inequality. Inequality about wealth, about power. Valorized capital in a way that I'm lost sight of a lot of other things. So I guess for me, what I would say is my answer to your question would be, I hope that makerspaces offer a, a crucible for change and that perhaps we can start to move away from a global, globalized consumerist view where everything optimizes for cost and takes it down to the lowest common denominator of automated production or whatever chains to perhaps something more local, more collective, where we do it agency and more power over the things that we produce and we're actually taking advantage of local skills and pairing things looking after them tat will arrive on a boat and i think jenny yeah i mean there's there are loads of challenges that we're facing at the minute, and it feels like you know we're not addressing most of them at the minute. We need to be running out more of them. And I guess to some, I don't know, like on some level, if if oil suddenly becomes loads more expensive, we can't just have container ships puttering around the world, like running on clinker oil. Um, so that's going to get more expensive. So your cheap tap from China isn't China isn't going to be as cheap. Um, and we need to work out how we stop using so much plastics and how we kind of start electrifying everything um, and using different materials and stuff. Um, so it feels like there's an opportunity if we can kind of, you know, I, I suppose with a groundswell of not the kind of fully automated luxury 
communism, but more just of a cooperative and more kind of communal um, existence, like there's going to be sacrifices, but I don't think it's going to, you know, life is going to be different as the climate emergency unfolds, but I'm not sure it necessarily has to be worse. Um, and so maybe that's, you know, I don't want it to be the nudge that we get to, but we're not going to get any say in the matter. Um, and so maybe if you get like a kind of, you know, universal basic income, then all the people working in call centers will be freed up to go and spend their time, what they're really interested in, which might be working out how we take circuit boards. And instead of having a pick and place machine to place all the components on it, we have a pick and place machine taking components off it and sorting them into bins so that my supply chain is partly just like, well, there's a load of 0603 LEDs just like lying around here that have been pre-sorted by some cool machine that we built um, because we know how to make machines like that because we can, you know, we've, we've got Arduinos and, and all that sort of stuff and it's all open source hardware because that's the way that we can work out how we can repair stuff more easily because all of the um, components and, and the schematics and things are shared. So I, you know, can just download the Dyson on off button i mean it will, i won't be able to for a dyson one but you know given enough time i'll be able to download the open source dyson compatible because you know the, the dyson compatible on off switch is already on the internet because we shared ours um, after we designed it and 3d printed it um so you know maybe that's the way out and the, and the kind of open source movement can continue because it feels a lot of the arduino and that kind of stuff was was basically all of the software well not just all of us software people kind of think, this is how we do stuff in software world. <laughs> We're just going to apply all of these approaches to, to the real world now. Uh, why, what do you mean that we can't just do this open sharing stuff and what have you? Um, and, and so maybe we'll just continue to infect that and the groundswell will build and, and we'll build a you know newer commons that, that have all of these kind of parts and things that we need to build. Somebody needs to build all of the physical things that we have in the world. Why can't they be kind of you know, open source, locally manufactured uh, and, and kind of built by people who are getting paid a decent wage. Hi. No, I've, 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 got an, I've got a specific question in here, but you said so many things, there's loads of stuff flying around my head, so I'm going to kind of try and pull it out. I think it's one of those, definitely more of a question than a comment kind of things. Um, so when I, I asked a question to the, previ in the, the previous speaker, I said I didn't really know much about makerspaces. And then when you asked, you know, who knows about makerspaces, I didn't put my hand up because I kind of felt like I've been in the makerspace only once or twice. I kind of follow a bunch of makers on Twitter who are like um, building things with electronics, doing stuff with knitting. You've got kind of cosplayers and 3D printers and all, all the stuff you mentioned. Um, and it seems like a actually really quite diverse group. Whereas my, my background's more from the hacker community. And it's a crazy community, right? We've got like these superstitions and this folklore and these profits and kind of quite a strong ethos. And it's kind of, it's kind of dying. And um, I just wondered the question to each of you is just kind of what do you think the, what do you think the maker ethos is? Or is, is there a maker ethos? And if so, like in one or two sentences, what is, what is the ethos of the, of the thing? Um, I've, I've got an entire blog post when I tried to work out if a maker of movement was a movement because there was talk I was challenged uh, I was in another talk Liz Corbin sort of said it claims to be a movement but it, like it doesn't have any manifesto and or aims or um, so I at times it feels to me like it's more of a cultural movement so it's a bit like the hippies or punk um, where it's well, that's it. Yeah, it's it's in a slightly weird place. It's about it's about giving everybody who wants to make the ability to make. Um, for me, at least, that's why I think it's important. Like, so not everybody has to be a maker. If you don't want to be a maker, that's fine. Uh, but if you want to be a maker, you should be able to go and find the things that you need to do to make to be able to produce stuff. I guess that's probably yeah. In, if you want one sentence, <laughs> um, I don't think I could define. Like, I think it is a very broad spectrum, right? And I think you're hacking as sort of a culture as part of it. There are, the maker movement encompasses much more anarchist, artistic collection collectives, as well as the more business oriented, really, there isn't a good phrase for this, is the kind of like pragmatic kind of, you know, we can engage with commerce without necessarily believing in it. There's a, you know, it's a, it isn't even a spectrum. It's a lot of different axes. That's a very complicated thing. 
I guess what I would like to see is, well, and I should also say, I think the Make Magazine piece, that particular kind of venture capital funded narrative around making, I'm kind of glad that may be coming to an end because I think that has glossed over a lot of the fascinating difference within the move within the groups within the movement in the past. It has been the frontest piece, which has been kind of glued over a lot of diversity. And maybe we can strip it away and start to showcase some more of that diversity. And I would like to see the maker community and maker spaces, particularly in the UK, because I can only focus on one place at a time and there's a lot, lot of issues here starting to work more with groups like cooperatives, like social movements, social organizers. There's some fascinating things happening about how we can organize collectively, benefit from network intelligence, start moving back to things like local money and mutual credit schemes and so on. So quite next generation kind of economy ideas. And I would like to see some of the maker movement being part of that, working well with it and starting to think about how we can create alternate futures that will address some of the issues of climate, resources, inequality, and so on. So I think I would like it to actually forget the last 15 years of Make Magazine and glossy capitalism and go back to slightly more community organizer kind of grassroots and actually have a political standpoint, be part of, you know, Extinction Rebellion, the Green Movement, all these other things that are starting to arise, connecting with the next generation and doing something useful for the future. I don't know if that answered your question, but that was the rant that I wanted to share. <laughs> Poor Jeremy's going to take the microphone away to make us shut up. I think it's my agency. It's about things like having the right to repair and the power to have control over schools and revaluing things like maintenance and care and not just valorizing new consumer products. Thank you very much. I'm very conscious of the time and time limits. Um, um, we do have something on Twitter um, from Mike Beardmore to say uh, the, the webinars worked really well. It's as though I was in the room with you. So, uh, not actually a question. Um, <laughs> are there, we, we do have to draw it to a close because we're going to get slung out any minute now. But as usual, um, for anyone who can stick around, the discussion will continue. It's been a fabulous discussion uh, up here for a few minutes. And then the coal hole over the road is the recommended drinking venue. Um, thank you to all our speakers, um, Laura, Adrian, Jenny, Tony. Absolutely fascinating even, evening, certainly in our strong traditions of stretching the bounds of what the British Computer Society can cover. Thank you all very much. Is um, Jeremy, this is quite a, a late invitation for me and I was able to, to drag Adrian along. But these are thoughts I think we've been having for a while and it was really nice to have this opportunity to force us to gather our thoughts a little bit more. And maybe, maybe, this will, maybe this will turn into a blog post or an article. But I think open source culture is an important part of what we should be integrating into the future of the maker movement. So thank you for giving us the stage and the excuse to, uh, to cogitate on these things. Okay.